call you in the church of God. Amen. 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 A priest at the holy altar of the holy Catholic and the apostolic Orthodox Church of God in the Diocese of Los Angeles, beloved of Christ. Amen. Amen. We call you Mina, a priest of the holy altar of the Orthodox Church. Amen. Be Pantokrator. Amen. Regarding uh, our Coptic community, uh, we feel there is uh, a challenge which is facing the relationship between the parents and their children, especially teenagers, which we call it a gap. And this gap, at least we can identify two kind of gaps. The first one is age gap, because of the age difference. Plus, because of in our Coptic community, there are many parents who are, were brought up in, the, in Egypt and they came here as adult. So there is what we call cultural gap. This cultural gap, the difference between the American culture and the Egyptian culture. Because of age gap and cultural gap, there's a communication gap because if the parents from a different culture, so they find difficulty to communicate with their uh, kids. And this communication gap uh, has at least two reasons. One, the language, especially when a family who came in, uh, in middle age and then their children, they a uh, few years they became uh, very fluent in English, but still the parents are not that fluent in English. So they communicate with the kids, they speak in Arabic, the kids, they respond in English. So they cannot have the quality to uh, c communicate in essential and important issues. Well, our youth are facing many challenges today, uh, due, of course, to the various cultural uh, differences uh, between uh, what they're experiencing and what their parents experienced growing up in a different country. Um, they have many more pressures on them in terms of uh, the, friends, the friends that they have and the types of influences that those friends might uh, put on them in terms of uh, uh, music and art and uh, use of entertainment uh, in the internet and so on. And so they're being formed by various um, outside influences uh, that oftentimes their parents don't relate to. And so there's a widening gap between what uh, our youth are facing or what our youth are experiencing in their own lives that's forming their personalities and their, and their personhood and what their parents uh, experienced growing up in Egypt or elsewhere. And they're used to everything being uptight, being a very a community oriented program and here it's not that, it's everyone's on their own, everyone does their own thing. There's no, there are no parameters for anyone. It's the sky is the limit for anyone here. Because I was born and raised in Egypt and when my children were born and raised in this country, uh, definitely there is a difference of understanding of the surrounding and also of accepting um, what is right and what's wrong according to the Egyptian culture and to the American culture. Um, and you can take on that and, and measure uh, many topics like for example dating, like uh, listening to music, like going out late, like what kind of, of do I have a say of what, who, who you be friends with or not? Uh, staying overnight, dancing, going to Brown, all these issues of the uh, American culture that was not in the Egyptian culture becomes an issue of making a decision. Culture of Egypt is, uh, is very strict, very formal, very rigid, whereas the Western more, uh, c culture is more open and free and liberal. 
and there you have the cultural gap. Parents are always usually very traditional, very like the way it was in Egypt is the way they want to continue it over here with you. And then they hope that you'd continue that with your kids and your wife and everything like that. And it has to be exactly the way they were raised in, in Egypt and then in the church. So they're very hard to, to put past things that, that go on in America that you see maybe your friends with their American parents or whatever. Um, it's difficult for them to see that the parenting from that point of view it's always the way their parents did things, which is perfectly normal, but it's hard for kids to accept because their friends' parents do things a lot differently. The gap really becomes a significant issue as they start to become teenagers. And uh, at that time, the issues of the uh, morals and the culture, uh, character of the parents uh, versus the, the way the kids uh, were brought up in this society creates a definite gap. You know, that your actions are dictated, who you spend time with is dictated, how you spend your time is dictated, and that's not how it works for teenagers here in America. They choose what they wear, who they hang out with, where they go, and for the most part, many of them can just inform their parents as opposed to ask their parents. The cultural gap between the teens and the parents, mainly uh, because the teens are much more able to adapt to this society, especially the first generation and the second generation youth. It's, they, they're, most of them have been born here and raised here, and they become, in a sense, uh, this is the only society they know. So it's very easy for them to be a part of it. The gap, it's majorly, mostly I would say that it's education, no matter how high of a level of education they got in Egypt, it's still a different society, a different tradition, a different everything. Everyone does their own thing here while in Egypt everything is a community. It's a very tight community. The majority of the time the parents are not educated here. There's a big cultural gap uh, between them and the kids. The kids grow very quickly and ad assimilate very quickly to the culture, to the thinking, the, 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 the technology, every, the media, music, whatever. And the kids adapt very rapidly to it. Uh, however, the parents, in a sense, stay behind. And because they stay behind, the kids are getting assimilated quicker, the gap grows. And it, it sometimes creates a division at home because the parents don't understand why their kids are doing something, even though sometimes it's not wrong. But the parents see it as, I've never done this when I was a kid, so now you can't do it. And it creates a problem, fights, division, and a gap. The cultural gap is, is uh, perhaps the most obvious that uh, in many cases, um, our youth, myself included, grew up in a country that's different than the country my parents grew up in. And so um, those things that form our personalities, those things that form our, our, um, our ideologies, our thinking, um, are different between our parents and ourselves. And um, so that creates a gap within the family, creates a gap between parents and their children. And sometimes that gap um, can be uh, bridged through adequate and effective communication which is the answer, in my opinion, to, to bridging that gap, is, is to, to reach out through communication to understand one another. Um, or it can be widened in the case where there's a lack of communication in the home. As a teenager, the greatest difficulty I had is with control. And now I hear it from my Sunday school students that it's still a problem between them and their parents. And I. I figure it's cultural because in Egypt, what the parents say is what goes. But here in America, there are options as to how to do things. There isn't just one way of doing things. And so my parents would say one way, but I would have five other ways, one of which I strongly preferred and was not an option for them. The point of the parents wanting to control 
their youth is very real uh, and they want to uh, feel like they have some authority still and the for us coming from Egypt uh, Egypt tends to be a much more conservative country uh, where there's natural controls there I think because of the society and the culture and when families come here to the States that control is left out and is not there so the parents I, be I believe feel like they have to enforce their own set of controls uh, which is good in a sense but sometimes it could be overdone and it steps over um, the ba bounds of their natural authority as parents and s in some sense tends to suffocate the youth. Uh, as they grow a little bit older than that and they get into high school or early college it becomes a matter of why and no. I'm not gonna do it because it's you know I have my own personality and I want to do what I think is right. For the parent for example to think uh, going out late is wrong for the young man at, at the age of 17 or coming to 18 he'd say no it's not because everybody else is doing it. When I was a teenager um, I remember requesting sometimes to stay out late for school activities or gatherings and my parents had a very difficult time with it even though I was a boy and, and um, I could take care of myself to a certain extent and uh, I remember my mom constantly saying, you remember when I was a kid, I never got a chance to do this. I didn't get a chance to go out until I was late college and even past that. My mom used to tell me your curfew is so-and-so time very early. And she was having a difficult, difficult time with me staying out. In college, it got a little easier, but still till today, she would call me around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, see where I am, what am I doing? If we're talking about Coptic families, one of the biggest challenges is acculturation. Uh, the young people, of course, more quickly adapt to the society, whereas their parents are more in tune with their culture back home. Now comes the, the culture that we were brought in. Uh, it becomes a gap and an issue of a struggle. Now when the kids get into early adulthood, like after the age of 18, they start feeling their own freedom that's given to them by the law. And then the gap becomes a matter of, uh, I'm not going to listen to you unless it's on my own decision. And then it becomes very difficult for the parents and they have at that time to try more or less to be friends with the children rather than to be uh, old parents alone. A lot of times you'll find that the parents think that they have all the answers and that they're always right. And many times they neglect the opinion or the feelings of their children. And this can create definitely a, a, a gap or a barrier between, uh, between parents and children. I think what's recommended is that there should be mutual respect. Not only that the, that the children respect their parents, as that's one of the commandments, but the parents should also respect the needs and the wants and the feelings of the children. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe. And confess to the last breath. And confess to the last breath. That this is the life giving flesh that this is the life-giving flesh that your only begotten son that your only begotten son our lord god and the savior jesus christ our lord god and savior jesus christ took from our lady the lady of us all took from our lady the lady of us all the holy theotokos there is also the generational gap and that's existed from the beginning of of, uh, of creation Whereas with subsequent generations, you have changes uh, that occur uh, and through time, changes from ag agriculture society to industrial society and so forth, there's different generations face different challenges and different uh, technologies, different advancements. And the newer generations feel like that they are perhaps more advanced than the previous generation. And in that sense, it creates a gap. 
it's the age difference that's a big thing. Uh, the parents are accustomed to one cohort or one era, and they may find that uh, the issues today are much different. Even though there may be peer pressure, and th which there was 40 years ago as well, but the issues are different. There might be more uh, drug use today, there might be more addictions, there might be more um, promiscuity. Of course, th there's, uh, th there's always going to be a generation gap. And with our parents, there was a genera generation gap between them and their, and their parents. So this isn't something that um, is unique to us living in the United States or Canada or anywhere else. Um, and with those two, the cultural gap and the generation gap, uh, what it translates to into ultimately is a, a communication gap. There's also a communication barrier when discussion really isn't permitted. Discussion is limited to what you're being told and that you should take it. And so that doesn't really allow for discussion, which really limits understanding between a parent and a child as to what you're experiencing and what you need from them. It really limits to five minutes, two minutes, this is what you need to do. Or uh, definitions that they don't understand. Or uh, at times, you're really just supposed to obey. Obey is really the only word that you need to know. Respect, obedience. Uh, if there is any other communication besides that limited communication between you, you need a third party like a priest. You don't believe me or you don't understand it from me, go to Abuna and he'll set you straight. Bless the crown of the year with your goodness for the sake of the poor of your people, the widow, the orphan, the traveler, the stranger, and for the sake of all of us, who entreat you and seek your holy name. For the eyes of everyone wait upon you, for you give them their food in due season. Deal with us according to your goodness, O you who give food to all flesh. Fill our hearts with joy and a that we too, having sufficiency in everything always, may abound in every good deed. The language, for example, the young people pick it up very much quickly. Yes, they can communicate, but when it comes to discuss of a certain issue, which you need a, a, a deep discussion, uh, then this gap uh, of this communication problems appear. Plus, there's a different mentality and different understanding of, of, of things, which lead also to the, the, the communication gap. And that becomes an issue. It becomes a power struggle then. Who's got more authority? The one with, that can speak better or the one that is fumbling over words uh, because the parents, of course, are, aren't adapting as quickly. Language is the biggest, is the biggest gap because it's hard for like if your parents want you to to do something that they've only the, the only way they know how to do it is in Arabic or communicate it to you in Arabic because that's how they were taught their parents didn't have that struggle so they don't know how to deal with it but they want to tell you what to do and you don't want to listen to it because you don't feel like hearing it in Arabic or you don't understand it or you know you never had to do it this way and so the parents try as much as they can I know my parents try as much as they can to, to break it down for me in English, but sometimes it's too hard and then it becomes a gap that you can't fill. Hanging out. Hanging out is not really a term that's understood by our parents. The lingo here is very hard to translate for them. My friends one time were, were talking to my dad. They came to visit and they were talking to my dad when I first moved here. And they were saying, yeah, Sharif is really cool. So after they left, my dad came to me and they're like, why are they saying that you're cold? Why are they saying you're cold? That's not a good thing. That's, that's not nice. There is a language gap um, in terms of our parents speaking Arabic as their primary language. And most of us uh, you know, speaking English in the West as, as our uh, primary first language. Children, teenagers, they assimilate 
to a new country at a faster rate than their parents do. Um, and um, uh, so sometimes that could cause, you know, a distance between the two. Uh, one is faster than the other. Because our parents were not raised with the same kind of thinking, they saw it as argumentative, as American, as an American way of thinking, and it wasn't tolerated. It was met with anger and resistance. Because once you are speaking more of the language and expressing your thoughts, the older you get, the more educated you are, the less you're able to communicate with your parents. Uh, this gap creates tension oftentimes in the family, um, usually expressed as, my parents don't understand me. And that's kind of the common expression that uh, youth express um, out of frustration, that they're not understood. So there's a certain sense of uh, isolation, alienation, um, that our youth are experiencing from, uh, from their parents and sometimes often from other uh, forms of authority like the church. Uh, if the church is not in a position to understand uh, what they're going through and their experiences, uh, then oftentimes they feel alienated from the church. So this gap is, is, is uh, experienced in the home, it's experienced in the community of the church, it's experienced um, in many aspects of their lives. And so we really have a challenge to help direct the parents to the resources uh, within the church uh, to understand how to deal with uh, their, their children and how to better relate to their children, um, as well as um, within the church. How are we as a church um, creating activities and, and educating ourselves on the culture and on the challenges of our youth so that we might address their needs and at the same time fulfill the mission of the church, which is to bring, um, to bring uh, our children into the kingdom of God. Stand up in the fear of God and listen to the Holy Gospel. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John. May his blessings be with us all. Amen. From the Psalms of our Father David the Prophet and the King. May his blessings rest upon us all. Amen. The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. Everybody here in the United States is very busy. When a new family came to the United States, of course, they face many challenges to, uh, to settle, and uh, the, the, the father to find a job maybe has to pass through some exams, the same as for the mothers. So they are very busy. Some of them, they work more than one job to support the family. So they don't have time for their kids. And they don't have time to listen to them because they are, they are busy. And this is add to the culture, add to the age gap, because if you don't have time to listen to your teens, how you can understand what they are suffering and what are their needs. I definitely think that uh, the father who works very hard and stays out of the home for the purpose of income, um, it, it's going to play a role if, if the mother is the one who is trying to raise the kids at home. Um, traditionally, Middle Eastern men want to be maybe the source of income to take care of the family's needs financially and maybe they overlook other factors that would be essential for the upbringing of, of the children. Uh, more importantly, time. Uh, they, they, they sacrifice time so that they can m meet the needs of the family financially. So that's definitely a big issue. What you oftentimes find is that immigrant parents, uh, whether it's Coptic Orthodox or any immigrant parents, have tremendous uh, stresses and challenges that they face in the new country in trying to put uh, to put together a stable uh, living environment for their children and that will uh, contribute to their or take away sometimes from their ability to be patient to be understanding to devote the time necessary to develop a strong connection with their kids because they're just they're dealing with having the to deal with the uh, surviving in this new country, uh, putting a roof over their children's heads, having food in the house, getting a job, uh, just dealing with all kinds of different things. So that in and of itself 
can put a distance between children uh, or teenagers and their parents? Um, the parents' social status. In Egypt, they may have been professionals, and then they come over to the U.S. and they have to start over again. And so you find a decline in their social status, and that becomes uh, kind of an uh, affects their self-esteem. You know, parenting in general is one of the toughest jobs, if not the toughest job uh, in the universe, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then put a, upon that the challenges and stresses of immigration, and you've got quite a lot on a person's plate. I'm pretty sure our children would think of us at one time or another like an old-fashioned, uh, like they will never understand, and like uh, they come from a different planet. I'm sure they thought of us like that at one time. The older generation looking at the younger generation saying they're immature, they don't know what they're doing, and we have to teach them and we have to protect them from the insane society and the dangerous society we're in and the younger generation looking at the older generation and saying they don't know what they're talking about they came from a different country different culture different background different education they don't know what i'm saying they don't understand me and they're not trying to learn what where i'm coming from the parents are fearful and they may be overprotective thinking that their children are, have become westernized like you said and this is a fear of the unknown because they themselves are from back east. And so coming over here to a place where uh, uh, the culture is different, the timing is different, uh, social status is different, they don't know what to expect. And so their first instinct is to be overprotective. And so of course the youngsters are going to rebel against parents who are so rigid and, um, and are not flexible in any way. The cultural gap is based on respect because in Egypt, it's like, I've seen it in many, you know, many situations. The kids have the ultimate respect for their parents. Yani, my dad used to tell me stories about, I don't cross my legs in front of my father, you know. And my, my giddu tells me, like, I stand up when my father comes into the room, you know. Or nobody sits at the table until, you know, my dad comes. It was a big, it was a big parent respect issue. The kids now, they want their parents to be more like their friends. Uh, I think parents, they expect that the same values and traditions and morals that were kept in Egypt should be similar here, here in the U.S. And when they see that that's not the case, then they get a little perturbed. As I make my own decisions of what's right and wrong, I am affected by my upbringing being in the Egyptian culture. It makes a big difference in what age did you come to, the, to this country and, and if you went to the education system here or not, uh, in how big the gap becomes. Teenagers often have a different definition of what is respectful. Um, the parents grew up in a culture where respect meant you never disagreed with your elders. Your elders were always right. Um, your elders uh, shouldn't have to say, I'm sorry if they make a mistake, um, things of that nature. And so res the, the teens have one definition of respect and then the parents have anof another definition of respect. And um, when a teen questions their parent, not meaning any disrespect necessarily, it's all, it might already be translated in the parent's mind as, wow, this kid is disrespecting me. Um, and helping parents to understand that as long as children are questioning and disagreeing in respectful ways,
that that can be considered an acceptable thing. It's all about expectation. The parents are hoping that they can maintain what's familiar to them when they come over here. And they're surprised. They're surprised at um, the liberalism that they find amongst the youth who are trying just to fit in. Um, of course, the youth can take advantage of the freedom that they find in the United States when they find open relationships, for example, out on the street or in school, and they think that maybe this is the standard and this is something that maybe I should, to fit in, it's okay to be in a, in a relationship even though I'm still a teenager. So sometimes the youth take advantage of this freedom concept. Um, and of course this creates a cycle with, with the parents being more rigid and more overprotective. Mom, I'm sorry I, I lashed out at you like that. It's just that you know how I feel about the things going on at home right now. Daniel, please listen to me. People get to arguments sometimes. And as you know, your dad has been working a lot lately, which leaves him no time for us as a family. I feel like we're growing apart and our difference of opinion just keeps getting worse. With no time for each other, I just feel we're, we're totally lost here. When we speak about bridging the gap, of course, efforts be, should be done from both sides. Of course, number one, the parents have they spend time to learn the language of the country. To, to try to learn the language and adjust to the society and accept that it's different. There is no way that in America your kids will be raised the same way you were in Egypt. In my first year in uh, being uh, in, in Los Angeles, in one of the youth convention, I attended a, a group discussion for high school age. So I asked the group a question. Suppose you are the Bishop of Los Angeles and your first priority is to serve the youth. What is the first thing to do to serve the youth? here. So I remember a girl, she, she immediately, without even thinking, responded saying to listen to them, which shows that they feel that is the best thing to do for them, or what they need is to listen, to listen to them. I think advice to the parents about how to deal with communication really has more to do with listening patience, and letting a lot just roll off your sleeve. Because what comes with your being young and becoming more educated is arrogance. And that was really, on my side, what aggravated the communication gap, is my own arrogance. Well, of course, um, from the Christian perspective, we would say that uh, ultimately what the child needs is love, that the primary responsibility of the parents is to, is to express the love of God. Number one and the most important thing is to show our kids our love. We have to show them a lot of love. In many ways and in everything we do, we have to assure them of our love. And if we do that and the child realizes that I love him so much, he might accept all the orders and all the regulations that I, I give him even though he doesn't like it. Uh, one of the first things is that I uh, help parents to realize that unless they take care of themselves and their physical, their mental, their spiritual health, they're not going to be very good uh, to their, do very much good to, for their children. As parents, we, we feel the need to provide for our children, which is healthy, which is normal that we need to provide them with their material possessions, which is good. But we have to be careful not to overdo it, because in overdoing it, we, we can spoil them, one. Two, we can be so busy in providing that we're not available for them. That the parents are able to identify the positives in their children and praise and encourage and show their pride to their children of their positives, not just point out where 
they're not doing well or when they've made a mistake or when they've acted in a bad way. One of the kind of difficult sayings of our Lord in the Gospels, uh, he said, do not call any man on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. And uh, when we try to understand, according to the fathers of the church, what this means, uh, we're told that there's only one father because the, the, the attribute of fatherhood rests only in God. And nonetheless, he allows us to partake in his fatherhood. He allows us to participate in that quality which is unique to himself. And so, uh, ultimately, what uh, parents, fathers, and mothers um, are required to do is to express those same uh, attributes of God within the family, to express uh, the attribute of love, to express the attribute of patience, to express the attribute of um, kindness, to express the attribute of compassion, um, truth, all of those things which um, define for us the attributes of God ultimately are what uh, is required of the parents. Actually, I have moms that come to me and say, um, you know, my son smokes shisha. Please help him stop. Tell him to stop. So I talk to the youth and I talk to them nicely and, and uh, you know, uh, and, and don't tell them, you know, my source or something. <laughs> but, um, but then I find out that the youth's dad does shisha. So it, it, it's very hard for me to try to convince this youth that it's not something good for him uh, because obviously his dad doesn't think that. One of the toughest thing about being a parent is role modeling. Um, sometimes we parent with the idea of do as I say but not as I do. Um, and that doesn't work because children, teenagers, they learn more by what they see than what they are told to do. So if I want my child, my teenager to be respectful, I hope I'm modeling respectful uh, behavior and communications. When they watch me talk to my husband or when the husband is talking to the wife or when we're talking to the teens themselves, Boys need their fathers. They need them there. They need to be with them. They need to play with them. They need to just be with them, hang out with them. That's it. That's the only goal. Um, and uh, so I make it a point, uh, thank God and God willing, I'll continue, to spend just time with my boys where I'm available to them every day. In terms of making the gap less is uh, to be able to apologize to their children when they lose it because we're not perfect. Parents are not perfect. Never were, never will be. Um, and But uh, what a gift you give your teenager when you show them enough respect to say, you know what, Habibi, I made a mistake. I, I made a mistake. I lost my temper with you and that wasn't okay. And I apologize for that. Um, yes, as a parent, it is my job to correct you when you make mistakes, but it's not okay for me to do it in that way, and so I apologize. The best way to overcome this gap, in my opinion, is to educate both sides of what the culture was in Egypt and to, for the kids to uh, learn what the culture was in Egypt and for the adults to learn the culture here and their point of views, even if they don't want to accept them fully, but to accept them to some degree to cope with their kids, to adapt with their kids, and to know how their kids are thinking. And that's the most important thing, um, just for both sides to know where the other one's coming from. Uh, giving uh, freedoms as the teenager shows responsibility. Uh, so slowly over time. But that has to be set up from, the, from when they're even younger, this notion of uh, when you show me that you can handle certain things and make good choices, you're going to get the ability to do this and to do that and to do this and to do that. Um, so that's really important as well, um, in, instilling in them that they have to earn the freedom, that the freedom is not just a God-given right, um, that when they, sh when they show the parent that, yes, I can handle going out with my friends, 
and not making bad choices when I go out, then maybe you'll be able to go out with your friends. For the parents to overcome uh, this gap, they really have to uh, put up a, a very strong fight, a fight with their culture, with their uh, background, and with what they believe is correct and right, but it's only related to the culture, not to what is really right and wrong. This point is very important because we have brought with us from, from uh, the Egyptian culture a lot of habits, a lot of ethics that really came to us from the culture. It's not really some wrong with it or right with it. How can I translate the values, beliefs, morals that were passed down to me in a way that makes sense given what my teen deals with in 21st century America? Um, so how can I present it? How can I role model it? How can I talk to my teen about it? Uh, what kinds of activities can I get my teen involved in or encourage in my teen so that they learn these kinds of lessons? Um, I think one of the challenges, again, is um, trusting that uh, allowing my teenage child to be involved with non-Egyptian, non-Coptic Orthodox people, that automatically that that's going to be a bad thing. Um, Hopefully parents from when their kids are very small are teaching them that in any culture, in any society, there are good folks and not so good folks. And that I, from a very young age, would teach my children how to pick the kids and the families that are appropriate. Uh, so that means the parent has to be involved in school. The parent maybe needs to be part of the PTA and get to know other parents in the school. Uh, the parent needs to uh, invite and have, uh, you know, play dates at their house where the children come over and they get to meet the children firsthand and help the kids figure out which are the good kids and the not so good kids or the good families and the not so good families. I think if we were to give advice to the parents, I would say to them to try to understand the dynamics of your children, try to understand their developmental level and try to put yourself in their shoes. Try to remember when you were a teenager, for example, and what, what struggles you were having, and what were the, the pressures that you were undergoing, and how did your parents help you through that? So for the parents, there has to be a level of empathy. They have to be able to try to understand their world rather than saying, I bring these traditions from my country, and this is what I'm going to instill in my children today here in this different society. So there has to be some level of transition on the parents' part. But it comes with understanding, it comes with validation, it comes with supporting their children through the struggles that, um, that they're seeing day to day. One thing that I do, uh, that I urge parents to do, is to uh, give their teens room to have feelings their emotional reactions, and that all feelings are acceptable. It's okay to be angry, it's okay to be frustrated, it's okay to be irritated, disappointed, sad, worried. All feelings are acceptable. Um, and that to give the child, to give the teen space to come and talk to you about it, even if you don't necessarily agree with what their response is, but give them the right to have the feeling and to express the feeling and for you to validate, yeah, it's hard sometimes. I know many times when there's conflict, there tends to be either lack of communication or arguments. But if the families would set aside times um, in the evenings, for example, where they would come together and recognize their needs and recognize one another's values and thoughts, then we'd be able to come with some kind of a compromise between parents and the youth. Be open to the environment. Um, and, you know, this is not just um, Egyptian immigrants or Coptic Orthodox immigrants. This happens in all the different cultures, Asian cultures, Latino cultures, you name it. Um, sometimes they are so fearful of losing their cultural and religious identity in the, in the new country that they totally reject and decide that they're not, they're going to limit and be at, you know, 
do the bare minimum to be involved in the rest of their society. And I don't think that that's a, a good option. I think that that sets up for all kinds of problems because it's not realistic. You're living here. So you have to find a ways, ways to assimilate without losing cult, completely losing cultural identity and religious identity. And it's totally possible. But it means that you have to jump in jump into the waters and, and, and test them and see what's going on and pick and choose the aspects of the society that you are going to allow your family to be a part of. Mina, you're just killing everything in your way. No, same game, keep going. No, Mina has to work Oh, baby. Oh, oh. The teens, they also have to work to bridge this gap. Firstly, to have trust in the love of their parents to them. I tell teens, there is no one on earth love you more than your father and your mother. Even if you don't understand them, but trust their love and be patient. Don't depend on your thinking or your mind, you understand everything. But you need help. You need to benefit from the wisdom of your parents, from their experience. Don't, don't say, oh, they are Egyptians or uh, they don't understand the society. Don't say that because there is things which are common in any society. And even they don't, if you feel they do not express themselves as the way which you like them to do, but look to the love behind what they are telling. To try to build trust with the parents, and that means taking care of the everyday, standard living things that they have to do. If it means making the grade, this is something that is their responsibility. If it means um, not breaking curfew, coming home on time, they have to do that. If it means um, a sharing in the chores at home, they need to do that. Once they begin to, uh, to be trusted with those things, then maybe their parents will begin to trust them and let go more of the reins and allow them more freedom, and then there'll be more of an understanding between them. But there has to be some kind of a communication between them. And your parents need to know where you go especially when you're younger, because something that happens in the American culture that doesn't, that should, and is actually a positive for the Egyptian culture is that no matter what, your growing up and your freedom of thinking and choosing need, still needs guidance when you're younger. And when you're still in your formative years, your teenage years, and you're trying to learn your own identity and who you should hang out with, Sometimes you're just going with the flow because you want to be accepted and you're not discerning between where you need, where you should be and where is going, and the places that are going to be dangerous for you to be in. And so absolutely your parents need to know where you go so that they can help you with that kind of discernment and just out of respect because even in those years you're still dependent on them and their advice is still valuable. Even though that relationship is modified as you grow up, when you're a teenager, and even when you're in college, it's absolutely necessary that they know where you go. Look in the class. You find kids from broken families. They lack somebody to care for them. So thank God that is your parent is caring for you. I once had an experience, because I myself, as I mentioned, have, was born and raised in the United States. And I, I remember as a teenager being so frustrated that I had a curfew and I had certain, uh, I wasn't allowed to participate in certain kinds of activities or events or parties or things like that. Um, and my mom would have to pick me up from everywhere I went. I couldn't just go with other people and so on and so forth. And I was so frustrated and I hated being the child of immigrant parents. And well, my parents don't know, they don't get it. Ah, da, 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 da. And I remember one time I was complaining to an American friend of mine. She had no curfew. She can go as come as she pleased. Her parents never knew 
where she was or who she was with or what she was doing. She had every freedom in the world. And she came to me one time and, she, and when I was complaining and, you're so lucky, you have, you know, da, da, da. And she said to me, Margaret, you know what? At least your parents care. If I died tomorrow, my parents wouldn't notice. And I remember being very struck by that. So trust the love of your parents, trust their wisdom, and be patient. Well, a good part of it is to always keep the child or the kid close to church somewhat and to keep him with a father of confession or someone that they trust. Because if they do, then they always have a heads, they always have a heads up for anything that's coming, anything dangerous. And I think of just making sure that they're with the right crowd, giving them their freedom, but they still have to know that they're with the right people. The most important thing is to get the children at early age attached to the church because this is the sanctuary that can attend them at that time. At that time the kids are far away from their parents because they cannot understand what the parents are doing. They are not mature enough to see the logic of the parents and they are full of energy and they are not children anymore. They can control them. So they go out and they rebel and during that time only uh, the presence of the church, in my opinion, is that can help them. And I think our, our goal, I think our work with the youth is to try to help them understand that their parents are looking out for their best interests. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, but the other thing is to also allow the children to take responsibility for their actions too. So if they find themselves uh, abusing their privileges, they have to recognize that and be honest um, with their priest so that there can be a healthy mediation between the priest uh, as he enters the, those dysfunctional homes and tries to come up with some kind of a, a compromise. You need to be very, very, very grateful to your parents for immigrating to this country. Um, they have made amazing sacrifices. Um, so that they can make a better life for you. And it is really hard to raise children in a new country when you're trying to get used to everything and figure out how everything works and, and so on and so forth. So um, while your parents may not be perfect, um, you, you have to take them as a package just like they need to take you as a package. You're not perfect either. And you have to be willing to realize uh, the amazing things that they do for you every single day uh, that you might take for granted and act like, oh, so what? Um, because being a parent is the toughest job in the world. The Bible definitely says in the fifth commandment to honor your, your father and mother. And that means respect them. And that means um, heed their advice. And that means even if you believe that your parents are in the wrong, you still have to treat them as your honored father and mother. Um, and they will always be your parents. And um, so the Bible stresses that. We ask you, O Lord, to give you grace to your servants so they may do the work of salts in your holy church, and they may sing unto you hymns, chants, and spiritual songs from their hearts to the Lord. So the grace, compassion, and love of mankind, O lover of mankind, which comes from your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, now and forever, and end to the ages of ages. Amen. David, the Psalms in the Church of God. Amen. 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 The church uh, has a special and important role in bridging this gap. Number one, for teaching 
the parents. That's why we organize parenting classes for the parents and courses to help them to understand uh, the how to bring up their kids and understand the, the characteristics of every phase in their life. We conduct a family retreat when we speak about this issue from the priests, from people who are specialized in this in this field. And also in youth conventions, we also deal with the relationship with parents and how to deal with them. As a church and as a priest, we have to evaluate everything according to the, to the divine scriptures and uh, to the teachings of um, our holy orthodox faith and to the fathers of the church and know our faith well so that we can um, differentiate between what might be a cultural uh, issue versus what is truly a matter of Christian behavior or a matter of our faith. With specific cases, the father of confession, he can help to bridge this when they come and complain, the youth, so they can talk after their permission to, to the parents. Uh, when visit the family, they can bring them together. And youth can come and speak to the priest, speak to the, the bishop, and then the bishop can speak to the parents and how to try to help to bridge this gap because youth, they trust the clergy and also the parents do the same. We have to think of what are the needs of our children in terms of the spiritual needs, because if their spiritual needs are met, then, uh, then I think all of their needs will be met, the psychological needs, the social needs, and so on. So we need to understand what those spiritual, what, this, what is the spiritual uh, life within the family? How do we cultivate the virtues within the family? How do we practice love within the fa family? How do we practice patience? How do we practice compassion? How do we practice uh, the positive aspects of our faith, like the life of prayer? Do we pray together as a family? Do we open the scriptures and read the Bible together? Do we talk about the things of God? Or is the child being exposed to fighting between the father and the mother? Is the child being exposed to um, the father uh, engaging in inappropriate behavior, excessive drinking and maybe other types of behavior? Uh, is the child exposed to um, uh, the mother on the phone gossiping? Is the child exposed to all kinds of activities within the family that don't, don't portray the, the beautiful uh, picture of, of the, the church in the home that we want to see? And if that's not there, then the child is not being fed the spiritual food that he needs. I think the church played a great role in shaping my personality. Our parents are always at church because we're always at church. Or, you know, those of us that are always at church see that their parents, you know, if they've been taking them since they were young, you know, now you drive and your parents come right behind you. And so the church that has activities for the parents, I know that, you know, sometimes they get counselors at church and stuff like that to teach the parents about how to parent their kids in the American society and you know to do all the things that you know we've just talked about. I think the fact that the church is now also conducting its services in English, uh, of course maintaining our Coptic language as well which is very important, but to, um, to be able to to preach our sermons in, in English and to conduct our divine liturgies in English and to be able to have um, our, our youth meetings uh, in English, I think this helps that communication gap so that our youth don't feel um, that uh, there is a gap related uh, to, to language. Well, I think that uh, the diocese ordaining more priests that have grew up here and were educated here is a huge turn because those priests know and have experienced things personally and most of them even have kids that are growing up here and they know what the parents are going through. They know what they personally went through. And I think that's absolutely great. And that's gonna help everyone in the long run as well in the short run. And it's gonna be great for both the parents because they're gonna get to be educated about the surroundings and the youth because they have someone they connect with. The way to bridge that is, 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 is um, in the West. We have to ordain and encourage more um, of our youth uh, to be ordained in, into roles within the church as deacons, uh, priests, and, 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 and bishops. 
and uh, monastics also, so that monasticism thrives outside of Egypt as well. And uh, this will help to create um, a hierarchy within the church in the West that, um, that grew up um, speaking the language and um, in the same environment that our youth uh, grew up in. Um, and this will help significantly, I believe, in the ministry of the church. So making things interesting for the youth and making them participate in the youth meetings and, and being part of the church, uh, serving as deacons and deaconesses, uh, being in charge of church magazines, being in charge of outings, being in charge of uh, sun, uh, some Sunday school classes, being just a lot, given, being given responsibilities. One th if youth are involved in something, then they'll enjoy it a lot more. Say between the parish priest and the servants of the church, um, I think there has to be some kind of mediation. Uh, and mediation might require visitation to the homes and just understanding the dynamics that happen between parents and their children and trying to come up with negotiations, all about compromising. Um, parents, can you give in in this particular issue? Or parents, choose your biggest battle and let's decide on what you stand firm on. But the other little things, maybe let's have, let's give in to the youth. Let's have them try certain things provided it's within certain parameters. Um, so it's about mediation. It's about, uh, it's about bringing parents and children together and communicating on a level where there's mutual respect, where there's love, where there's honesty, honest communication, um, and there's sharing, there's open sharing. That's going to be necessary in order to come up with some kind of uh, peaceable agreement between them. I think in my own life uh, I can attest to uh, the importance and the success of the church um, in fulfilling its mission um, to, to somebody like myself who was raised outside of Egypt, uh, speaks English as, as a first language, um, and uh, ultimately became a priest in the church. Um, I grew up uh, in California my whole life. Um, I experienced and saw uh, all of the same types of uh, challenges that our youth experience. And nonetheless, uh, because of the strong foundation that was uh, in the home, the spiritual foundation that was in the home um, from my parents, um, and being fed by the church um, and being given that um, the, the richness and the beauty of our Orthodox faith um, as experienced um, in the history of the church but also in, in the lives of the saints that are alive in the church today. Um, somebody like myself, completely outside of Egypt and, and outside of the culture of my parents, was able to see the richness and the glory of our, of our church and our faith and ultimately um, was asked to be ordained as a priest um, and now serving in the church. I think uh, the role that's played now by, by this interview example as part, as I understand, of a complete uh, um, package they put together is very important. It is important for us to hear uh, from the members of the community. It is important for us to have uh, um, a media that can reach to all the hounds of the, of the cops in, in the States and give them this message and let them express their opinion. So I want to thank you for that.